Welcome to the Mount Hammer Podcast, episode 26. I am Mo, and I'm here with the awesome and lovely Luke and Eleanor. How are you both? Very well, thank you, man. <laughs> very very well. well, too. I wasn't expecting the really nice intro. It threw me off. Go awesome, yeah. and awesome and lovely. Awesome and lovely. You are. How's your, how's your week's been? I've been away for a bit, which we'll talk about for a little oh, bit. I was partying the entire time we were away. Were well, you? Missing you. No, so no, really. I was partying too. <laughs> we partied for Luke's birthday, didn't we, Luke? Oh, yeah. Oh, we birthday. did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy birthday, Luke Morton. Yeah, thank you very much. I got very drunk on Good Friday man. night and had a lovely time. Get anything nice? What did I get? I have clothes and money because I'm, I'm new, old now. <laughs> you got a new lunchbox. And I did get a lunchbox. Really? What lunchbox? It's just a blue lunchbox. <laughs> it's nothing exciting. It's like but, but I am get, I'm bringing my own food to work now, guys. Yeah. And I can't afford to eat around these fancy new parts of London. Wow. What a lovely time. Uh, don't forget that the latest issue of Metal Hammer is still on sale now. What? Still on sale now? God, it's only been away a few days. It is an Iron Maiden spectacular and they have just about, in fact they've kicked off now I think they've just landed yeah. in the UK haven't they started in Newcastle yeah, last night did Newcastle last night uh, Tuesday night if you're listening to this on uh, Thursday or Friday uh, Iron Maiden are tearing up the UK as we speak on what is beyond the doubt the most epic stage show they've ever put together we've got the only interview with the band about it all read it in the new issue right now and also don't forget that we've still got those special Iron Maiden bundles on sale we've got a couple of those still knocking about you get a Pharaoh uh, Eddie patch a copy of the new issue of Metal Hammer and an exclusive I made in mystery mini figure of Ooh. Eddie. They are sick as fuck. Um, and we've only got a few left, so I get on them because they will all go eventually. I can promise you that. Guess what I did this weekend? You had a quiet night in and nothing happened. <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> I went to Heavy Montreal, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Who uh, uh it, was, it was awesome. It was awesome. It's the second time I've been there. I went a couple of years ago. Um, and then they took a year off last year, I think, because the festival cr- scene is getting increasingly crowded in North America. So I think right. um, you, you see festivals kind of take a year off every now and again over there at the moment. Uh, but yeah, it's awesome. Montreal, I'll, I'll say as a side note, is just one of the best cities ever. Um, it's If anyone ever gets a chance to go there, go there. It's brilliant. It's beautiful, full of lovely French-Canadian people <laughs> speaking French at you and just being nice. How was it really French? pretty. Uh, not bad. I did. I did make the effort, but um, uh, some of the people in Montreal are quite French in that they're all they're either really nice and Canadian or the slightly more French areas. They get a bit fed up if you try and speak French at them, and it's just not working. So they just go oh and just talk at you in English. So I did. I did try. I've been practicing on Duolingo. Um, so yeah, it was all right. I, I gave it a go. You know, I recognised that a pub called. Happy long men, butterfly. Yeah, that's, that's, that's something good. I've learned. So sweet. That's about it. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it's, but anyway, the moral of the story is it's a really nice city, and I highly recommend it if you're ever thinking of going out to Canada and such like. Um, and yeah, the festival was fucking great. It's at this uh, this semi man made park that's on an island in the middle of the Saint Laurent um, River. It's like their version of the Thames, and it's got this big old green, nice looking island on it that they host festivals on. Uh, and the Heavy Montreal was over two days and on the Friday I actually went to a punk festival called 77 Fest punk's not really my thing mm. um, so I was kind of there just like observing and seeing what was going on and you know um, but yeah that was decent and it was a bit, a bit smaller they only used about two thirds of the heavy site for it felt like quite a family um, atmosphere which is okay. weird for a punk festival that like sick of it all are playing <laughs> but um, all kids under 10 could come in free or something like that so a lot of like you could see all these older punks bringing their kids along which is really cool, oh, that's cool. nice to see them getting a, a festival experience yeah. uh, I saw Anti-Flag who were really good again not my thing but I thought that what they were doing was great Sick of It All great um, I saw me first in the Gimme Gimme Gimme's I think they're crap Yeah. Uh, just like I don't like that type of music at the best of times but just twee covers of songs I just can't be doing with it I saw The Interrupters who I know are a very hotly tipped band at the moment in yeah, that scene yeah. I thought they were great as well um, Rise Against are really good but undoubtedly the band of that day was AFI you surprised me, mate. Yeah, <laughs> predictable because they are one of my favourite bands. But um, yeah, they were great. Although I do have to say, once again, not the most uh, kind of passionate crowds going, which was weird. Not the most partisan crowd, basically, for AFI. So that's three times I've seen them in the last year or so now, and I still feel like I haven't seen them with a crowd that's really there for AFI. Do you, well, to be fair, the past two times was that Deftones and Download yeah yeah. I, I guess yeah, yeah but neither of which were there 
show. I think if you saw... With yeah. Download, I kind of hoped that because it was their first... You know, it's a festival show, you're going to get a lot of fans coming to see Band yeah, normally yeah, yeah. see. I was um, really wound up by that Download crowd, to be fair, for AFI. Yeah. I was just talking over it, I didn't give a shit. It was weird. And, and I'd say that it got better as the, the set went along. Um, they played, like, a couple of rarer tracks that I didn't see them play last time around. They played, like, a Greetings and Goodbyes... Um, off the art of drowning, they played Lost Souls as well. Paper aeroplanes, obviously, the story was great. Uh, and once they kind of got into a, a home run of like, you know, Days of the Phoenix, Miss Murder, etc., etc., people, you, you can feel the atmosphere pick up a bit. But in terms of the performance, they were just amazing. Like, Havoc, David Havoc is one of the best frontmen of all time. He sounds amazing. They yeah. all look cool as fuck when they're there. Um, so, easily, easily stole the day for me. Uh, but then we went on to the main event, which was Heavy Montreal, which is a much more metal festival, much more in our ballpark. Um, at just one of the most kind of, not random, but varied lineups, I think, of the summer so far. You had like Marilyn Manson and Rob Zombie, kind of, um, you know, Limp Biscuit as well, who stepped in for a Ben Sempel, as short notice. So you've got those kind of real like mainstream metal bands, but then you've also got real like Quitty Acclaimed, cool bands like Ajira, Emperor played, Baroness were there. Um, you got like weird stuff like Voivods, you had Thrash like Power Trip, Sleep were on there, Asking, Alexand- Al- Asking Alexandria and Hollywood on Dead were on there, so you had the kind of senior stuff as well. So it was a real mixed festival, it made for a really cool lineup. You just saw, mm. you, you really saw fans of every kind of wake of metal and rock um, there across the weekend. Uh, and there weren't really many bad sets, like everyone turned up and was pretty awesome. <laughs> yes, that is a band called Ultra Vomit. <laughs> <laughs> I was just pointing out stuff on the I was just looking at the poster I saw a bit of them I couldn't I think it was some kind of kooky wacky shit I wasn't really into it Uh, but yeah day one um, Paul Bearer were great Uh, they were on quite a big stage there were like two main alternating stages like Sonosphere used to have over here oh yeah yeah and Paul Bearer were on one of those and it did swallow them up a little bit they didn't look like they quite knew how to kind of move around it and fill it but they sounded really good um, the Black Dahlia Murder were absolutely crushing to the surprise of no one, I'm sure. Napalm Death were great. Baroness were probably the band of day one for me. Just a band that seems to keep on getting better and better and better and more brilliant. Yeah, it's don't do bad shows. Yeah, yeah, just so gorgeous. Songs that can be kind of heavy and make you want to bang your head off and then cry your eyes out in the space of two minutes. They're just one of the best bands in the world right now, I think, and they're awesome. Um, I need to talk about... <laughs> How much Canadians love Ailstorm? For fuck's sake! It's, so, I think any. So, if we just take away the fact that they're a pirate metal band and they do what they do, we've talked about gimmicks and metal on here before and stuff. You know, they're a pretty big bands. Probably, you could make a, a serious argument of one of the biggest British metal bands of the last ten years. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. there's not many bands you could genuinely say they are definitely bigger than that band. That said, I was absolutely floored to see what must have been at least 20,000 if not a, a bit more than that people turning up to Ailstorm and not just turning up but losing their shit and I swear to God seeming to know the words to like every fucking song of the set it was it was really surreal this is a pirate metal band from Scotland and I would say on the stage they were on that day which was one of the two main stages the only bands that got a bigger uh, turnout were probably in fact across the whole weekend it was probably the headliners in Trivium you know, they got a bigger uh, pull than Baroness. They pulled more people than Rise Against did the day before, and they were headlining that festival. It was just bizarre. And, you, you know, you have to say it was a really good atmosphere. They had that big rubber duck that they bring out on stage, and they kicked that into the crowd, and it was surfing about, and people were just having a lovely time. People all got on the floor at one point and did that row, row your boat yeah, thing yeah. that people are doing now. Um, there were crowd surfers, circle pits, lots of proper sing-alongs. I can't look at that and say that other than that's anything else in a really fun, successful festival set. So yeah, I think that's fair play to them. Yeah. It was just, it was just weird to see Baroness be so emotionally <laughs> involving yeah. and brilliant, and then just see these daft pirate metalers turn up and just get a significantly bigger crowd. That's so weird. You know, like I'm not mad about it because it's a festival. People are there to have fun, but it was it was weird. Yeah, in a weird way, I'm quite looking forward to seeing them at Bloodstock. Like it's not my again th- high up that bit. Yeah, yeah, like, like third from top. Like, I'm maybe even the second but it's not really my thing I think the first album's a lot of fun but yeah that you know that's going to be ridiculously fun because that's what they do yeah it's just pirates and ducks and anchors and I think it's the time japes. for the naysayers among us which I'm sure we've all been and just to be clear there are some Hailstorm songs which are absolute bangers like I'll admit that straight up but 
um, I think it's just a time to just accept them as a kind of kind of like Sabaton really just they turn up they do what they do they yeah. they make a lot of people have fun live and that's cool and you need that at a festival so fair play to them um, the next band I saw after that was Emperor right. slightly, different. <laughs> slightly different vibe yeah. um, their first set in Canada I think at all for over a decade or something right, that's cool. so that was really cool um, actually no so I'm getting mixed up technically Emperor weren't as high up on the bill but Marilyn Manson played before Emperor because of the way they did the, the stage thing so yeah Manson I saw first he was okay mm. A kind of didn't he cancel his gig the day before or something it was he was supposed to play I think it was Toronto a couple of days before yeah. and he pulled out of that gig literally as they were setting his stuff up on stage because he's touring with Rob Zombie at the moment and Zombie had to come on and do a longer set and I think he might have even covered a Manson song yeah he yeah, covered Sweet Dreams that's pretty cool um, so not much. Manson song but yeah. well yeah <laughs> covered a Manson cover uh, and yeah it was okay like I think with Manson now it's just uh, I don't know it's you just you want it to be good so badly that I think you accept sets which if you'd if you'd been transported through time from 15 years ago and we're like this is what a Manson set is going to be like in 2018 you would be like that is fucking yeah. abysmal but because we've seen him be even worse than he is live around kind of 2009 to 2011 time when he was really really off it you kind of go to sets like that where everyone's having fun he seems to be enjoying himself but, and, it, and to be fair if he, if he was ill and that's why he had to pull the set then he might have been ill so he wasn't quite on his A game I don't know it's, it's a hard one with Manson I so desperately wanted to be good that I feel like I let him off sometimes yeah yeah I'm saying you sort of feel like oh he's hit and miss but he misses way more often yeah yeah, yeah he it's, does it's and a it, real shame it was probably the least good Manson set I've seen in about three or four years um, but that's not to say it was terrible it was just you know, I've enjoyed Manson sets a lot more recently, and that one wasn't wasn't all that. But there was an absolutely <laughs> colossal thunderstorm that uh, came down one song from the end, which meant he did "Beautiful People" while it was fucking it down, and there was four oh, lightning yeah. in the background. So that was quite that was quite cool. That was a bit weird. I don't really believe any of that negativity about Manson anyway, but it was just really good. Okay, <laughs> you believe that? Oh, that's fine. <laughs> not just not having it. No. No, we wanted to see him at Wembley and uh, refused to have it that some songs are better than the others. Like, no, all attend. They're all good. <laughs> it's yeah. all good. Yeah, I mean, again, it's a festival set, so everyone's pissed, everyone's having a good time, so it was a good vibe, a good atmosphere. I just think, given some of the other stuff I've seen that day, I can't say Mantle's quite good. Uh, yeah, day two of the festival, also brilliant. Shout outs to Sleep, Asking Alexandra are really good. Gajira are just that band that turn up and just be amazing. Yeah. They just don't do bad sets. So it's, it's all like, you can never not be blown away by it, but they just did exactly what I expected, which was just turn up and were brilliant. So that was good. Um, I saw Get The Shot for the first time. Oh, you talked about them before you left. Yeah, they're actually, awesome. Yeah. It was a t- like, as far as kind of hard double headers go, it was Get The Shot followed by Power Trip, which was like this kind of amazing 90 minutes of like thrashy, hardcore brilliant. metal. Uh, yeah, Get The Shot from Quebec, Quebec City. So they're not, well, it's probably quite a big uh, province, to be honest, but they're from the French part of Canada anyway. Um, So they spoke in French a bit, and a lot of people seem to be really into them. I don't know if it was kind of half a homeland band vibe, but they were great. Definitely check them out, by the way, if you haven't before. Uh, Power Trip, again, just mentioned it with Gazira, one of those bands that already it feels like they just turn up and they just don't do bad sets. They don't know how. They just smash it every time. And Trivium as well like one of the bands of the day one of the bands of the whole weekend so good being on the other side of the world and seeing that band especially with how in North America they've always struggled compared to England to fill big venues mm. they pulled a fucking massive crowd and they absolutely crushed it was it, it a was lot so of new stuff or just a um, just a proper right across the spectrum they played at least something from every album uh including and um, post Ascendancy I think oh no they didn't play anything off the Crusade I don't think um, but yeah, ev- everything sounded good. Um, it was cool seeing people properly lose their shit for. Um, oh no, what's that song? What's the good song off the Draymond album? Strife. Uh, people went mental for that one. So it's interesting to see oh, how. Because cool. it was, I imagine it was a very big deal in America when they did um, the David Draymond album, Vengeance Falls. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. he's such such a big deal over there, um, and you could kind of see that in the in the crowd reaction. They got a way bigger response than I think it would have over here. So that was quite interesting. And yeah, just just so good to see that band absolutely crushing it. I nipped off um, just before the end of their set to catch a little bit of Chemist. 
Oh, cool. They were fucking great yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah, they're wicked. Uh, kind of doom metal bands. Kind of in the vein of Paul Bearer. If you like that last Paul Bearer album, you probably like the, the Chemist album that they just put out on uh, Nuclear Blast. They were really, really good. Yeah, caught a bit of them at Roadburn this year. Oh, yeah, cool. It was, yeah, just riffs. And yeah. yeah. It was wicked. Exactly. Not, not so fun. So it was, yeah, really good as well. Um, Hollywood Undead were just big, got a big crowds, but it was weird. It wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be. They got a lot of kind of more uh, straight up, like radio rock stuff. Okay. It's not really rap metal at all. And they were doing weird covers in, I don't know, it wasn't for me. Fair enough. By the time I actually popped around to see a bit of them, none of them were wearing masks or anything. So I don't know if that's like a thing. I don't really know. I think it might just be they come on in masks and then take it off again. Yeah, maybe. it was weird. It made For me, it made it very underwhelming because I was like, oh, it'll probably be a show and it'll be a bit of a spectacle. But it was just, just, just kind of dudes, basic yeah. US radio <laughs> rock bands. Like, not for me, I'm afraid. Now... Limp Biscuit. <laughs> Why we're all here. I'll slightly preclude this by saying um, my biggest issue with Limp Biscuit gigs over the past probably five years or so is that they've really started relying on just dropping random cover songs. And I think when you've got a back catalogue that good, you don't need to do that. I don't need to hear, I mean, they didn't do this this time, but I don't need to hear Limp Biscuit cover Nirvana or something. No, that was the worst thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, totally pointless, Wrong. unnecessary. What? You it's like wrong. that? No, it's wrong. Oh, right. <laughs> You're wrong. Got a for that then. It's wrong. It is wrong. It's just unnecessary. Um, that said, they came in at Heavy Montreal as very late um, replacements for Avenged Sevenfold, who have had to cancel their tour because Shadows' voice is in a bit of trouble. Fucking hope they get that sorted very soon. Yeah. We need them back on it. Alice um, and Chains have just been announced as replacing them at another festival. Oh, well. oh okay. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's not an easy... I don't think Avengers are an easy band to replace, really. There's no obvious band you could slot in that would have a similar, you know, demographic and fan base. So it was probably a more casual Biscuit crowd, and so I get it that they dropped a few covers and stuff. That all said, the first, I would say, half an hour to 40 minutes, maybe longer, was the best... A bit of a Limp Biscuit gig I've ever seen. Oh, fuck it was yeah. unbelievable. They came on with my generation and everyone just mm. lost their shit. People were just crowd surfing from the first song. Two songs in, Wes jumps into the third or fourth row, like literally gets up on the barrier and like pole vaults himself, <laughs> clears this thing, and then just plays the opening notes to break stuff. Fred catches on what's going on, he kind of catches what's going on, jumps into the crowd as well. Brilliant. So the two of them are just in the crowd as break stuff kicks off. It's all going mental. Um, then, they, then when it all calms down again after that song, Fred just goes, thank you, we are Avenged Sevenfold. And they drop a little bit of Unholy Confessions. That's so which is good. mental. So you just go, da, 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 and everyone reacted really well to that. Then they played Rolling. So it was just like ridiculous. <laughs> then they started fucking around a little bit. And they did like a little bit of Deep Purple and they did a couple of bits of Pantera and Page of Beats of Billy Paul, which nice. again, under the circumstances was quite cool. Um, and then yeah, the rest of the set was good. I don't think it quite matched up to that first kind of forty minutes or so. But they did Hot Dog Nookie. They did that Rage Against the Machine cover, Killing the Name. Yeah, right. Again, unnecessary in my opinion. But you could tell the crowds react well to it. So maybe they weren't expecting it or whatever. So mm-hmm. it kind of worked. My way was great. They did the Faith cover, which is great. Um, they got someone up stage. You know, they get fans on stage to do songs with them. Right. So they got someone on stage. And they gave her the mic to do uh, Eat You Alive. The song started and she just turned around and she went, I don't know what her name was, but it was something like, hey, I'm Kelly Smith and my Instagram account is blah, blah, blah. And Fred Durst went, whoa, 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 whoa. And fucking snatched the mic off her. She got kicked off the crowd. And then, uh, not the crowd, kicked off the stage and they had to get someone else on to do it. That's again. so funny. And I was like, basically what happened was some fuck nut jumped up on stage pretending that they knew the Lewis Olympic Biscuit song just so they could plug their Instagram. I was like, what world are we living that in now? That is so funny. And there was a lot of confusion what was going on because people were kind of just getting into the song and then he stopped. So that, that killed the momentum a yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, um, And it struggled a little bit to get back on probably after that. But they got a dude on who was like a proper metalhead looking guy. I was wearing an Inflames t-shirt. Oh, okay. All the worst eating me alive. So that was really Brilliant. cool. Um, and then they <laughs> That's did... That's so good about the Instagram thing. That's it was so weird. weird. It was so weird. Um, and uh, then yeah they did Behind Blue Eyes which was actually I know some people don't like that cover I really like that cover yeah, I, like I that. thought it was really cool it was a big festival sing along and then they did Take a Look Around and it was biblical so yeah Biscuit that the first opening 40 minutes stole the whole weekend for me which is quite cool because obviously they didn't they didn't uh, get added until quite late on but yeah apart from Manson being a bit hit and miss and Hollywood Undead um, being bum not really not really a bad band across no, the weekend. Like a good old time for it me. It was epic. Shout out Heavy Montreal and uh, yeah. 
Well done. Think, hopefully do it next year. Wonderful. What's been going on in metal while I've been away? Well, while you've been away... <laughs> eating poutine and watching the new metal. <laughs> well, Merlin. Uh, behemoth, or Behemoth, whichever we decide where to say it. Behemoth. Behemoth um, are teasing something uh, through lots of controversial pictures of Nurgle being crucified. Uh, yeah, they are not fucking around, are they? New and I'm full in on the old religion. And if yeah. you recite a prayer into your computer microphone, you can hear some new material, which sounds like just a weird choir intro. Did you try that? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I didn't. I, 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 I was going to ask you. I'm not, not buying into the viral marketing at not all. Not really. I, I was just like, no, reciting no, 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 no. a prayer. You were talking about this yesterday. I didn't know. Does it give you a specific prayer to recite, or do you have to make? Yeah, it I, think, I think there's something you have to read off the screen or whatever. But Lewis, who um, also works at Hammer, said if you, if, you, said, if, said, if you wait long enough, you can just hear it anyway. <laughs> so I was like, oh, fine. Enough. I want to know what prayer it is, Lee. You're not giving enough information. Well, okay, I've got a bit of information, but a tiny, tiny amount. Uh, so I'm on fa- my phone. fans wishing to. Where am I going? To hear the audio, it's, I think it's bearmoth.church. Um, you have to yeah, recite. <laughs> You have to recite a short prayer before the snippet can be heard, but apparently you, you might not need to. But there's also a countdown on the website, which ends this Friday. So, who knows what's going to happen. But I'm right. ready to pray. Good. Here's a prayer. I'm praying. Go on. I'm praying to my phone. I'm phone praying. Brilliant. Finish praying. Are you trying it? You're trying this live? This is live on air attempt to crack the behemoth prayer code. It keeps saying finish praying and start praying. Well, this is going great. Why isn't it playing anything? This is the real spirit of radio here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't Oh, hang think... on. Prayer of Behemoth. Living God, I shall not forgive. Jesus Christ, I forgive thee not. Ooh, oh, wait. Uh, is this it? Yeah. Ooh. It's not working now. Well, this is just... Oh, come on. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Are we allowed to play this over this? I don't know. <laughs> no, you're not allowed to play music. But... So there was a specific prayer. <laughs> there was a, there was a, there was a prayer, but that took forever to get known. Yeah, and then we, we might not be able to play it on the podcast anyway, for legal reasons. So that's good. That's good. So yeah, Behemoth are doing a thing, and yeah. it's probably going to be really offensive. Go listen to it, and uh, if it's anything like The Satanist, it'll be one of the metal albums of the year. Because yeah. that was one of the greatest metal albums of all time, in my opinion. So Ooh, there you go. Controversial. Have that for a take. <laughs> yeah, what else, what else is going on? <laughs> I'm still trying to pray, sorry. Just forget it, Elle. Stop praying. I'm pr- I can't help it now. Uh, well, Slash has released his first single from his new album. Should we try and listen to that? <laughs> 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 not less as a prayer. That's what I'm into now. So. What are we saying about the new Slash song? Which I've definitely it, not heard because I was away. <laughs> it's... All right, it's it's a weird one because I really like Slash, I, and when you listen to him, you can tell it's him, and I think that's great because there's not many guitarists that are like that. But it's Miles's voice I do struggle with sometimes, unfortunately. Really? Yeah, like, I think he's great and he can sing, but I don't know. Like, yes, that's an understatement, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Miles can. He's all right. I think he's great, and I think he can sing. Look no, yeah, no. fantastic. Yeah, voice. yeah, he's got a fantastic voice, but I don't know. I think I just. Because you hear like Slash's guitar and you think, yeah, it's going to be some fucking you know, sleazy rock and roll jam sort of thing. But I think Miles' voice fits that aesthetic that well. But I think the song's all right, personally. Um, but I've never been a big solo Slash guy. I pretty much, I, the Snake Pit stuff I never really bothered about. Even yeah, The I was, first album he did, I mean, actually, I like the first album he did with Miles. I don't know how many albums he's done with Miles now. I thought that was good. I thought the one he did with Guest... Loads of guest vocalists on, like Fergie was on. And all yeah, that. yeah, yeah. It's really bad. It's, that was the first person I remember. I just didn't <laughs> yeah. remember Fergie being on it. That was really good. Um, so, yeah. And I think Eagle Eyes, Eagle Eyed followers of your Instagram account might have thought that you had some time with Mr. Solman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. The man from Stoke. I, I, I did. Yeah, I had a nice sit down with Slash the other day uh, to talk about, well, Anything and everything. Some of the questions came from our lovely readers. Excellent, excellent. Uh, which you can see in a new issue of Metal Hammer soon. Ooh. Plug, plug, plug. Little teaser there. But yeah, the song is okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Metallica are apparently picking their set list based on local Spotify data, is what it says on these notes. Yes, that is according to Spotify's uh, CEO. Interesting. So uh, me and Luke having a big fight. I'd probably say that if I was the CEO of Spotify. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> me and Luke having a big fight about this, aren't we, Luke? Yes, yeah, so if you think it's a stupid idea, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Okay, go on. 
So just, just to clarify, Metallica apparently picked their set list based on Spotify. Well, they look the, at Spotify and they... The quote from Spotify CEO Daniel Ek, I believe it's pronounced, uh, says, uh, you, have art, you have an artist like Metallica who changes their set list on a city-by-city city basis just by looking at Spotify data to see which the most popular songs happen to be in that city. I think that's a cool thing for bands to do. I think it removes an element of spontaneity. And you're obviously always going to get bands playing hits, but it's cool when they like bring something out you've maybe not heard in a while, or even something you've not heard, and then you love it. But surely you're more likely to hit, get spontaneity if the set list changes from city to city than if a band goes, like maybe they're playing the same set yeah. every maybe night. Ne- well, occasionally we'll test stuff out early on, but maybe never really change their sets. Yeah. Uh, that's just the set list for this tour. Whereas Metallica are changing it every day. Well, that's but too... they only spit out the bone in London. I think that's a good point about changing it each day. I think that's a valid point. I think that's interesting because you're not going to predict what they're doing in the sense if you look at the old set list or you go to a mm. show in a different city, you're going to get another experience. But I also think just choosing them based on the most played songs does remove an element of spontaneity because you're just surely just going to get sort of the biggest hits and stuff like that and I think it's good to just have wild cards thrown in not for the whole set you don't want to go and see a band play like all the songs you never listen to obviously you want to kind of connect with it and you love mm. the material but I think it's good to throw stuff in there that's a bit off the wall no I don't disagree I think yeah, it's good when you see bands even throw out a new one that, that you know this you know you might be your favourite new album like when they did Spit Out the Bone in London that they hadn't done it anywhere else I thought that was amazing or they get to do a rare cover or a B-side or whatever like. but I'm sure they're not going to be Metallica wouldn't be that rigid to go no we can't do this cover that we all like playing because Newcastle don't want to hear it or whatever well I've seen bands do albums in full and sometimes it can be great because you love it and it's the best thing ever and we've talked about this before and sometimes you see it and it just feels like you're listening to the record and I just wonder if it would kind of feel a bit like listening to a Spotify playlist not that it would because it's Metallica yeah, 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 they play yeah. a great show but I don't know I think maybe you could use it to guide you for inspiration but well, I think choosing yeah, the whole exactly. set based on it is a bit like mm, but even yeah. if Metallica, you know, picks their own set list, which, you know, it's not like they're going to go, no, nah, we won't do it to Sandman tonight, lads. You know, it's, it's always going to be the big, if they choose it or if the, the crowd chooses the set list, it's always, like when they did the Sonosphere, um, was it On Demand thing, like you pick the set list sort of thought. Yeah. Of that, was, that was still, even then, it was, and it's Sandman. It was Sandman predictable. True. Yeah, exactly. Was, yeah. But I, think was, but I think as well, there was some campaign in Germany that they ended up having to play St. Anger at the, the festival because everyone everyone voted for that and I think they maybe they really yeah of all the I songs think, yeah I think it was a bit like a joke or it was a thing but yeah I like that song so whatever but, okay. I, but yeah but it's, that's what I mean you could it could be open for you know, to be skewed if everyone in you know London or whatever it's been hey let's all listen to this really obscure Metallica song loads so they have to play right. it you could definitely so, see that happening someone would start a campaign to just get something really random yeah. put in the set well I've actually got a little caveat for this because when I interviewed Metallica for uh, our cover in ooh, about 18 months ago um, Lars said to me that he has his own personal uh, database that he keeps that he that's how he works out when to pick out surprise songs because he looks at what songs they haven't played in territories for a long time. Oh, that makes sense, yeah. Which, I don't know if that goes against what Mr. Eck is saying about Spotify, or maybe he looks at, he, he'll go on Spotify and say, oh, wow, loads of people in London are streaming this, sort of, like, spit out the bone. We haven't played that anywhere else on tour, but they like that, so maybe we'll pick that out. Yeah, yeah. Because it, from what he was saying, they make a point of pick, throwing out songs that they haven't played places in a while, so people get a nice surprise. I think that's cool as well, because it shows they're actually caring about the people that go and see them in that area, and it is kind mm. of like a special treat then to get new stuff. I nice. mean, the best, um, the best Metallica set list I've ever seen was in Roskilde about five years ago, and they did Carpe Diem Baby straight into um, I Disappear, which was insane and I thought it was interesting to have those two I mean the two songs are actually like six or seven years apart or something but to have those two songs from a quite a specific period of Metallica's career kind of like the short hair like when they were kind of doing like more like hard rock stuff mm. both in the same set so I wonder if that's because they did have a look and you know they worked out that that uh, that Denmark really likes that stuff or something I don't know right. it's just a very just loves unique of couple of songs to drop one after the other like that um, so yeah they obviously think about it a lot though which is cool yeah, yeah. so I think I think Metallica are at that stage now where they just don't bother playing the same set as they've been obviously they'll be like 
80% of it has to be there. Yeah, but yeah, course. they will just go, I want like this one, I want this one. And if they are picking it on local data, I think that's quite interesting and cool. It is cool. I mean, you know, when you look at what Maiden have just done, and uh, as we mentioned, you can read much more about this in the new issue. Um, Bruce basically picked that whole set list this time, which doesn't always happen. Mm. Normally it's between Steve and Bruce and a, you know one of the other guys might have a couple of ideas, but Bruce literally just went, I want to play this, 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 this and that, because we haven't played them in ages and they're wicked. And that's quite cool as well, because you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're just looking at stuff that, you know, The Clansman is one of the best Maiden songs ever, but it's just not going to get the same reaction as if they bring in Wasted Years or something. It's just not. But they don't care, because they know that there's a good hardcore portion of Maiden fans that will really appreciate that. So I think there's a lot of ways that you can work to build a set list that will please people if you're a, if you're a veteran metal band. As long as you're not just playing the same much shit all the time. Yeah, it's my main point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, yeah, I think that's a really valid point. It's like you were saying, Luke, you want people to switch it up. It's better when people do different sets on different dates, especially mm. in the same country, because often people do go to multiple dates if they can, if they're really into the band, and you don't want to see the same set you saw three years ago either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Totally. I'd, I'd quite like to see the data as well. I would be interested to see how the listing habits change from city to city. Honestly, yeah, I'd I've... love to see that, because different cities do have different vibes, and, you know different types of people in them yeah. I, I, I love um, I love I don't want to sound too nerdy but I love, Spotify is one of my favourite things to just trawl through to look at data because I think it I think people who if you want to step outside of your own bubble of like so you know in our, in our cases we're all late 20s to early 30s we grew up in with CDs and physical and everything else and so it's easy to get stuck in your mind frame of well I think this band does stuff like this and you know, these are their big songs, or this is how they operate because this is what my experience of it in mm. is. Um, and then, if you take a quick look at someone like Spotify, you can look at the data that actually shows you. Again, it might be a slightly different demographic overall, but it can, kind of shows you why bands operate in a certain way and why they think about certain things. You know, I just mentioned um, Biscuit saying "Behind Blue Eyes." That is their second most streamed song on Spotify, yeah, and it's cool. really close to rolling. Like they're both 100 and something million, and the next one back is like. 20 million behind it so I don't know if that's because it got used in an advert or a TV show or something like that which can obviously drive a big spike but if you'd ask people to name the top 10 most streamed songs by Limp Bizkit who the fuck would think that a Who cover of a really average album searching for the Who and they get it wrong and then they play it instead which could be another well yeah I mean and that is a way a band's off way you know you could what Disturbed did with the sound of silence and all that kind of stuff um, I, the random one just because I was looking them up for a different reason but Mudvayne what do you think is the most famous Mudvayne song? Dig 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 yeah it's not it's a song called Happy I fucking love that song I didn't even know it I yeah no, know it. It. oh it's amazing Luke talks about it's got time. over it's yeah. got over <laughs> twice as many streams as Dig does really yeah. it's a great song it's when they did short the it was really successful in mainstream American radio oh, um, okay. and so like it's just a really interesting way of looking at the way bands operate and the way they think about how to position singles and I imagine why to play stuff as well because you know Biscuit have played that Who cover most of the times I've seen them the last few years and I've always thought why are they fucking playing that and that's yeah. why because loads of people love that cover I'm going to have to listen to that Mudbane song there. <laughs> so yeah that got, that, not to get too nerdy about it but it's just good to take a look at what modern music fans are up to you know? interesting yeah, so there. Let's take some reader questions. www.facebook.com forward slash Metal Hammer Readers. Come join the party. It's good fun. Uh, Jack Coker asks, uh, are the, be- oh, the best bands who have never had a lineup change? Oh, I God. spent ages. I have ages, the right answer. I spent ages I trying to right find answer. one. Go on. Ramstein. Oh, that's a good one. Since day one, really? Yes. Is it? Correct answer. I don't think I could do better than that. I say I picked Rage Against the Machine. Oh. oh yeah, but they no, only. Rage are a different band. No, no, I'm not talking like that. I mean, Rage only really properly existed for like four hours. seven years or something, yeah, still. and then fucked off. Um, they're not my favourite, but I didn't. In fact, I really don't like them. But didn't Rush? Ne- Rush have never changed members, have they? I don't know. I've got a feeling they haven't. But I spent ages only going three through them, Wikipedia so. putting in bands I didn't think had changed lineups, but it turned out there was some fucking random guitarist for like two years at the start yeah, I think I think you can go things. from I think you can go from debut album yeah okay. because yeah. that's like you know I'm throwing system as well if it's from debut oh album. god yeah yeah oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I'll take drummer. them over Ramstein actually definitely no, they had a different drummer but then the, from the first album it's been mm. the same lineup. I think I, I mean, still think Ramstein's the right answer though nah 
Ramstein have done one classic album. <sighs> System are better than Ramstein. Yeah, come on. Every album System have ever done has been fucking wicked. Even their quote unquote worst album was a B sides album, and that's still bitch slapped most of the other stuff that came out that year. I prefer Ramstein. What's your second favourite Ramstein album? This is embarrassing. Riser Riser? It's quite a good answer, actually. That is a good album. <laughs> In your face, Merlin. Fine, fine, fine. Uh, yeah, but both very good answers, neither of which I thought of. <laughs> I think I think you would take it from first album, personally, because yeah, okay. that's the band that produced the magic that made them good, that, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can't do any better than that, really. Well, I'm just looking at random lineups. I've got I can't find yeah, They've got rid of someone at Anything. some point. Yeah, it's fucking rubbish. Oh well. Just be friends, guys. Eminem. <laughs> <laughs> Mulk Smash asks via Twitter. I think we've done this before. What's the best festival set ever, and then why is it a Monomath at Bloodstock 2017? A good shout. That was. That, a, is it, that was a good shout. It's probably the best Monomath show I've seen. I think. I did this by, um, because I think we've kind of talked about this before, I decided to pick my favourite sets from each of the main English festivals. Like okay, rock festivals. interesting. So for download, Slipknot 2009, I'll be stunned if that ever changes. It's the, the defining festival set of our mm-hmm. lifetime, I think. Um, from Reading slash Leeds, I picked Maiden 2005. Bit biased, but it, not necessarily the best Maiden show I've seen overall, but it was the best I've seen them perform ever because they'd just right. come off the back of that Ozfest shit show with Sharon Osbourne and you could tell they were still really fired up and really having at it and it was just great and it was a really weird set as well they were just playing like first four albums I think so that was really cool and from Sonosphere I picked Heaven and Hell 2009 mm, okay. the skies opened and it started pissing it down just as they came on with um, uh, the first track off the album which I can't remember but it was really good um, Bloodstock I was torn because I want to say Ghost but Ghost basically just did the same set we already saw them do earlier in the year so mm. I think I'm going to say Gajira from 2016 that was so good as well yeah. wasn't it? just pissed all over Mastodon and came on after him yeah <laughs> uh, but I'm going to say Gajira this year I'm fully expecting to be even better yep definitely definitely good. yeah so I've got I've got Metallica download in 2006 that was very good mainly for personal reasons it was the first time I ever saw Metallica and I thought it was just like the best thing I've ever fucking seen and obviously it's Master of Puppets in for at Donington yeah. uh, so Step Not 09 obviously we mentioned that before you mentioned Reading uh, I can't there's nothing I went to Leeds a few times I've been to Reading a few times I can't think of anything that's been so defining to me that it's like fuck that the only other one I thought of was uh, Avenged in the Tent at Reading 2004 because that, that was nuts that was when Waking the Fallen well, it had been out for about six months I think at that point and it was just they were just a different band back then and they've become yeah. a better band since then but it was you know Shadows were still screaming and the set list was just like just all Waking the Fallen stuff so yeah. it was unbelievable so I think I saw Pearl Jam at Leeds in 2006 and I thought that I saw them at Reading that year that was and it was like oh yeah but I was like thinking oh I'm seeing Pearl Jam but I don't remember going fucking hell this is the greatest thing I've ever seen yeah but at the same time, I think Gallows played that year, and obviously Gallows at, at, Red, at any festival is just mental, or was mental. I can't think. Yeah, because I would pick a Glastonbury one, but it would be not metal. So, Aww. maybe REM at Glastonbury that was amazing. Cool. Converge doing you fail me this year. Roadburn was fucking yeah. Yes, tears. yes. fucking brilliant. I actually, just mentioned Heavy Montreal. Um, seeing Killswitch there two years ago was the second best Killswitch set I've ever seen. Definitely the best Killswitch festival set I've ever seen. I crowd surfed in flip-flops, it was so good. Brilliant. <laughs> Come on, Anna. Well, I just picked one and it was Slipknot 2009. Yeah. I think as you guys have both said that as well, that's probably the best one. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it just is. Like, yeah. There's other, there's so other stuff and Download's done a really good job of, I think, massively escaping the shadow of Monsters of Rock. And I think, I think Slipknot was the set that did that. It was like, this is a download moment. Yeah, this yeah. This is a band from this generation that have stepped up. Um, and, you know, it just it was just amazing. Absolutely amazing. And that was off the bat. I went to see, like, half an hour of Prodigy before they even came on. Like, what a day. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Ben Wilmot asks, Man of War were announced to play Hellfest in 2019. Is this a band you'd be excited to see announced for a UK festival, or do they do nothing for you? Who's going to shed their metal cred first? Well, they do nothing for me. <laughs> Thanks, Al. Put yourself on the grenade for us all. Yeah, I don't Always. dislike Malo War. I sort of I love what they stand for, and and like there's a few songs like 
that, that I think are a lot of fun and are really good. I think if they played a festival, I'd go see it, but they are not. I'd definitely go see them at the festival. And probably like, a, a lot, I actually would say I like Manimore. Yeah. I like, I like them more than I just like them, but I think it's, they're not at that, they're not at that, I think they're headlining Hellfest. Like they are not that band over here. I would like time. to see Brothers of Metal. Good tune. Yeah. Good tune. <laughs> um, I think they, yeah, it's like what you said, Luke, when they finally, they didn't come here for years, and then they finally came in for that UK tour, and I don't think they sold out on it, mm-hmm. from what I remember. Feel free to correct me, someone, if I'm talking shit on that. But um, I just, it did, I just thought it was a little bit underwhelming the whole thing, and I was quite excited. You know, I was excited about the idea of it, but when they all got here, it just felt like it wasn't. I don't know. I think the biggest problem with Man of War is that they, for England anyway, is that people still don't know whether to take them at face value or not. Yeah. Because some people will argue that they're really t- tongue in cheek and they know exactly what they're doing and you know the whole loincloth imagery and all the songs about, about just how good metal is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Such so a greased up men. Yeah, and it's yeah, that kind of faux machismo kind of thing going on. Um, and in Europe, there's just like I don't mean this as an insight, I mean it as a compliment really. It's like you, you watch Eurovision and like how mad they go for it over there. Mm. There's like a complete lack of self analysis in it it's just we love this it's brilliant and cheesy who cares yeah whereas in England we're just a bit more cynical and a bit more self doubting I guess yeah to go with it and I just don't well, think they've ever clicked over said. here in the same way because of that look at I what really you don't. said about Aelstorm you know yeah exactly I feel like I have to I feel like I have to spend like half an hour justifying saying Aelstorm were really good at a festival yeah, yeah that's right. stupid isn't it just Why? go well that was fun good point Al I was talking shit <laughs> <laughs> just enjoy metal but yeah, just like fun. If they were going to headline a festival, it would have to be Blast Up, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would yeah. be the most metal thing. That would be fucking well. brilliant, to be fair. Yeah. Like that could happen if they're doing Hellfest next year. They they'll be around. I'd back that. I think that would be a hell of a. I don't know what night it would be, but you know, could, I was going to say. I was going to say, well, say a hell of a Friday night because it's like yeah, metal party because that's what Priest are doing this year. But I mean, oh, it could be any of them. <sighs> would back. Oh, yeah, I'd like to see my wall. Yeah, fuck it. So yeah, I'd be excited to see it. But I think it's, I think it's not quite what it is in Europe. So yeah. that'll be an interesting thing to see how it'll go down. Uh, Dave Musson asks, uh, oh, it's an interesting question. Is there a good time of year for a new slash unsigned band to release music in terms of having a better chance of catching your attention? And are there points in the calendar that are always stupid busy? Yes. Well, just and not in Golden yes. Gods week is my answer to that. <laughs> yeah. If it's within the kind of month of Golden Gods and download happening, just don't talk to us because we won't be here. Well, that's the thing, that's the weird one because all the like, bands don't release music during the summer, really, because they're doing festivals. But during the, but during the summer is when we're busiest. <laughs> so it's, it's just like. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say lots of big releases come out in September. So September's a really busy time just for stuff. But I'd say lots of stuff doesn't come out in like January, February. Mm. So if you really want people to kind of hear your music, maybe the beginning of the year is a good time. Like people don't have much money, so maybe they're not going to gigs and stuff. But in terms of putting stuff out and making a noise online, it's quieter in January, February. But is Dave talking about the best time to release songs or talking about us listening to stuff? Well, I think it says in terms of having a better chance of catching your attention. So I guess our attention or people's attention in general. And if it's people's attention in general, I'd still say kind of like... Yeah, definitely. Beginning of the year is good because just just not much going on overall in the world in general, unless there's some kind of massive news story. It's usually just people chilling out after Christmas, spending a lot of time at home, that kind of thing. Yeah, really. I mean, I um, mentioned Baroness earlier. Purple is one of my... Like, it would be a shout for my top five albums of the last few years. Um and I, I don't think it got nearly the attention it should have because they released it on like December 19th or something yeah yeah so it's like everyone was shutting down for Christmas a lot of the, uh, you know personally I think it's always good that, that people do their end of year list and all that kind of stuff I think it's a really fun time to be in the industry yeah. but most of uh, the industry's best albums lists totally missed it because they'd all gone to print yeah, and they'd all been done um, so yeah definitely not but if you're I mean if you're a new and un, you're unsigned band um, I don't know really yeah like September's normally, as Elle said, stacked with big releases. Um, in terms of Metal Hammer, we're, we're always listening. There's never a point where it's like, oh, I'm not going to listen to this for six months because we're busy. You know, yeah, it might take exactly. a couple of weeks to get around to stuff in, in certain times of the year, but um, yeah, the way we pick up music is always the same. Just ask Luke. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll help you. <laughs> if you want to What's on Honey Roll this month, Luke? Yeah, yeah. If you want to listen to Black and Hardcore every day. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Listen to the new Nat Atan album. It's there you fucking go. brilliant. Right on cue, fuck's yeah, sake. Yeah, it's not out till next month, but it's really good. They're new. There you go. Um, so, yeah. Don't, but don't, don't do it in Golden Girls Week. Yeah, just, just, don't, <laughs> just don't talk to us Please. in June. Anybody. Uh, Matt Heeks asks, who was the biggest letdown for you after meeting someone you admire that made you agree with the term never meet your heroes? What a sound has it end on? Well, <laughs> well unless, we, unless none of us have an answer, then everyone's great. Everyone's great. No. Uh, I don't know what that said. I can't think of any... Like, people I really admire, like my favourite fans I've had the chance to interview, I can't think of anyone that was a right prick. No, no one's been a prick to me that I can think of. My own, the only thought I had for this, it wasn't someone I, mo- uh, I met even, it was someone I spoke to over the phone, uh, interviewed Mick Foley over the phone. Oh, no! No, 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 and Mick wasn't a dick to me. Him. Mick He's wasn't nice. a dick to me. But basically, it was just for another magazine, and he was promoting whatever book he was doing on a stand-up tour, I think it was a book, and I only pretty much wanted to talk about, basically, fanboy about old wrestling times. And he had his agenda, I had mine. And it, right. and it was very much like, well, when are we going to talk about the book? And I, and I, okay. yeah, they sort of said that to me. And I was like, oh, I'm really not prepared for the book questions. I just want to talk to you about ECW. And, you know, That's really funny. And all this. I interviewed him around the same time because it was, it was just before you wrote for Hammer, I think. Yeah, it was like a few months before. I can't remember. 2012-ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I did that. I, did, I interviewed him on the phone at the same time. And we just talked about metal. It was yeah, brilliant. Yeah. And like, it's one of those things where, you know, big wrestling fan personally... Um, and we got the chance to interview him, and I was like, "Oh God, I hope he can. I hope he can talk about metal because otherwise, there's no point in doing this." Yeah, yeah. And luckily, I happened to ask him about something, and he started talking about how uh, one of his characters and one of his promos he did was inspired by Megadeth. And I was just like, "Right, we're off." Fair and yeah, I, I thought he was really nice. And I don't think we did talk the book, talk about the book that much. Maybe a bit at the beginning. Yeah. I was Maybe saying. it's because because of you. It's like I didn't talk about the book in that entire. <laughs> Whatever twat is next in line on this phone <laughs> call. I interviewed him on the same book promotion cycle, and we wow. didn't talk about the book. We just talked about weird stuff, stuff he'd done in wrestling and his weird experiences. This is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I must have been last in line. He's like, oh, I probably should have so promoted this book. You're not in the Mick Foley best friend. Plan, no, 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 but he was, he was really nice about it. It was very much just like I, I felt a bit embarrassed more than anything where he was like yeah but I am actually trying to promote this and I was like oh I just want to talk about you getting hurt all the time sorry you had that experience Lee. but yeah so if, I, if, 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 if you're listening Mitch, a different experience yeah I'm sorry one person that just came to mind actually uh, that we talked about earlier um, is Fred Durst uh, I interviewed him at Download about five years ago or so and uh, he was really I don't want to say he was standoffish but he was really really guarded for the first like, I'd say ten minutes, um, and after I think I think when he's someone like that, because Fred Durst is used to being the joke of metal, mm. like everyone used to take the piss out of him. And I understand why sometimes he says stupid stuff, and he comes from an era of bands that a lot of the metal scene have a lot of distaste for. Um, so he's, I think he's used to people taking the piss out of him, and he's used to being treated like a bit of a punchline you know mm. and so he was very guarded with us I don't know if it's because we're from Metal Hammer or whatever but it took about 10 to 15 minutes for him to warm up and then when he warmed up he actually was pretty good after that and afterwards I actually said to him like look like I just want to let you know like you're part of the reason I was doing this I got into Metal through Limp Bizkit and I really appreciate your time and everything else and he, that really seemed to affect him he was genuinely like Oh shit! Oh wow, man! Oh shit! And he just t- his demeanor totally changed. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, when he realised I wasn't some piss taker, basically. Yeah, yeah. Which made me wish I'd said that at the start of the interview, but <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to look like a fanboy or whatever. Yeah, so yeah, that was that, at first I was a bit like, oh no, he's really not happy about this. But by the end of it, he was he was pretty cool. I always thought that he would be super fun, and then when I spoke to him, he'd gone through some really depressing times, and he was quite downbeat, and I was quite surprised, because I thought it would be, I'd never spoken to him, I thought it'd be like, hey, I'm Fred Durst, and he was not like that at all. Mm. Yeah, that's understandable. I mean, when he's talking about interesting interviews, Dave Mustaine, you never quite know which one you're going to get. Yeah. I've interviewed him about five times now, and I've got him when he's been grumpy, I've got him when he's been absolutely brilliant. Um, you just never quite know with him. It's always an adventure. <laughs> yeah, I, bet I must be lucky. I've interviewed Dave, I think, two or three times, and he's been really nice like, all the yeah, time. Yeah. I mean, I've had to say he's been nice more than not. I think yeah. he misplaced it, like, 
he'd misplaced something important or something when I talked to him one time, so he was really like stressed and pissed off. But yeah, generally speaking, I don't know if it's because a lot of the, I don't want to say old guy, but a lot of the veteran bands are a bit more chill nowadays. Like they, yeah, yeah. they're not kind of all drugged up, drunk maniacs being pricks to everybody. A lot of them are kind of doing yoga and like family people and stuff. Do you know what I mean? So they're a bit more, they're a bit more. Nice. <laughs> it, it, it seems to be more, you know, quote unquote, established bands are just, yeah, chilled now. It's like there's no point being dicks in interviews. Yeah, exactly. You know? I mean, it, it's funny because uh, the first time I ever interviewed Asking Alexandria, they were just pissed up and annoying. Um, and I spoke to Ben for an upcoming piece at Heavy this past weekend, and it, uh, it, he was a different guy. He really was a different guy. You know, he, again, he settled down, he's had a family, and yeah, yeah, exactly. that usual cycle. And we actually talked about that as well. We talked about the how bands are still on this treadmill of being fed all the drugs and drinks and women that they want going off the rails put on tour for ages and then they have a crisis and then they come back down to earth again and Asking have been through that and it was interesting see actually having now been there to see a band that they're most pissed up and weird and obnoxious and just being a bit not taking stuff seriously to just being like a nice thoughtful guy doing a good interview mm. so yeah well nice way to end this on Yes. Wasn't done Hooray for fans all. being nice. <laughs> Hooray. What are you guys up to this week? I'm going on holiday, so I'm not going to be here for the next podcast. Where the hell are you going? I know. Oh, well, I'm actually going on holiday holiday now, so I'm going to sit after, in... After your work in Canada. Yes. Off, off holiday. Hey, I did a lot. I did miss a few bands, all right? I did some stuff. <laughs> all will be revealed in some upcoming issues in Mount Hammer. Don't you worry about that. Um, but yes, I'm going to go sit by a pool in France with my mates and not look at my phone for a week. That's my plan. So you're not here next week? I'm not here next well, week. Well, next week's the Bloodstock preview, Merlin. Who are you going to recommend for Bloodstock? Oh, my word. Wait, one band. One band? Uh, Ailstorm. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> no, wait, hold on. Let me double check the line up again. Why? Who are you? Who are you? Well, we'll get, well, we'll, we'll get Jonathan in for his super metal take and uh, Eleanor and I will actually do some research rather than me springing this on you at the end of the, uh, Thanks. the podcast because I didn't know you weren't here. It's funny you say that because I am actually going to be up at Bloodstock on the Sunday this year. I'll be DJing the lock in uh, after show shenanigans, which I believe are on the Sophie stage. Right. Um, uh, each night is themed, and mine is 2000s. So come down, expect to hear a lot of fucking Lamb of God, Machine Head. I might drop a little biscuit track, maybe. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, that should be really good fun. But I mean, Judas Priest will be amazing. I think they might steal the whole weekend. Uh, yeah, Gajira, we just talked about. Nightwish. Um, Ailstorm absolutely uh, that all said if you for some reason haven't seen Power Trip yet go see Power Trip on that Saturday because they just destroy every stage they get to so yeah that's probably my serious hot tip is Power Trip good well I'm hopefully going to see Iron Maiden next week Merlin oh fucking hell yeah. getting it all done yeah, exactly but I'm hope hoping I get back in time to go to the second London gig on the Saturday Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, I've hopefully seen them in Birmingham because I wanted because obviously Bloodstock clashes with the London dates, unfortunately. But I need to see this maiden tour from all the lovely things Merlin has told me. And that you can read in the new issue of Metal Hammer. Yes, you it's, can. Uh, yeah, going to blow my little socks off. As uh, Luke just mentioned, don't forget that the new issue of Hammer is still on sale. Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden. <laughs> Iron Maiden. <laughs> and on a serious note, we do have other stuff in there as well that's fucking great. So I do go pick it up and buy a bundle if you want some really cool exclusive Maiden merch that you can't get any fucking where else. Uh, it's all on metalhammer.com. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Acast and leave us a review so we can smash through those charts each and every week. Thank you very much, guys. Have a, have a nice time next week. Thank you. I'll see Thanks, you in a fortnight. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>